Hi, everyone. So uh, if you haven't, who's seen one of my talks before? Anyone? Who has not seen a talk? Okay. Um, who has not seen a talk and um, has no idea about MGMT? All right. So you're going to be slightly out of luck because I'm going to go pretty fast. So I give lots of talks, or I used to give a lot of talks. I'm trying to tone it down. And so there's some concepts in MGMT I'm not really going to go over too much. I'm going to kind of skim over for time because most of you have done your homework and I've been around, there's a lot of stuff online. So if you're a bit confused and you're one of those people, I do apologize. I will try and answer uh, as many questions at the end as you want. And some of the stuff, it'll be a little bit hand wavy. Is that okay? I can't, I can't do much better. Um, so yeah, um, I have this project called MGMT. I'm going to be sitting down because I like to type, but don't worry, I'm still here. Um, you can see me. Um, we're doing real work now. Like this has kind of been a fault of mine because I've been working on this for a long time and I keep getting interrupted by having to work for like big companies to make money because uh, food is expensive and I like French butter and whatever. Um, and, uh, but I, it's been my fault for not really having something production ready. And I don't mean like hackable production ready, I mean really usable that delivers real value. And it's not enough for me to deliver real value. I want to deliver real value which is better than something else that exists. Like, I don't want to build Puppet. Like, I could already build Puppet. I want to build something that's better than Puppet. And only when it's better, then I think it actually counts. Is that fair? Yeah. So, um, this I've, I'm not going to show you the silly stuff. Um, who's read my blog? Just raise your hand. If you haven't read my blog, just uh, raise your hand so I seem really popular. <laughs> Excellent, everyone. Um, and, and honestly, I go over this you know, year after year, are we really honestly happy with the state of automation tools, of Ansible, of Kubernetes, of everything? Like, are we happy? Why isn't this solved? Uh, I know Adam's not happy. Um, and, and, you know, I'm not using Adam's tool, but I really fucking respect that he's building something because I love seeing different things. And even all of the different tools, whether it's Adam's tool, whether it's Q, I always get some value by seeing something different. And I steal as many ideas as I can to put into MGMT. Um, so I'm not really happy with the state of things. This is my nope guy. Um, you can see. Um, yeah. And uh, who, you've all seen this. I don't really like making slides. I don't have a VC to make pretty templates. So a long time ago, I started with this project called MGMT. This is what I made for you brand new. Um, I don't know if you can read that. <laughs> you like that? Uh, I'm, not, I'm not from the meme, meme world, but uh, I tried my best. Did I get it right? All right. Um, so previously, uh, and this is real, last year, um, I promised that I would not give a talk today if lambdas were not ready. And long story short, I want to have a very safe language. And the reason I want a, a safe language to declare everything is because if you have something that is managing a whole bunch of data centers, a whole bunch of data, if uh, something goes wrong and you have an off by one error, you are going to nuke a data center. Like if US East 1 or whatever the famous Amazon zone goes down, this is a really big problem. This is not okay. So we need to be able to type check things. We need to be safe. Um, random for loops that are unsafe in traditional imperative languages are not acceptable. And so I realized fairly early on that I needed Lambda functions. This is so you can do things like iter.map. You know when you have a list, uh, an array or something, and you iterate and apply a function to each thing? Yes? Who's no? Who knows? N no idea what I'm talking about. Don't be shy. Um, I, you really don't have to be shy, and you're going to see anyways. So um, it's a win-win. Um, this is a very safe way to do iteration, and we'll see why. And it was super hard for me to implement in the language. Um, and to be honest, I wasn't able to do it alone. I have a brilliant friend who's a super genius, and he just helped me with the hard compiler parts because I'm not a good programmer. And I'm even worse of a compiler engineer. So um, I think I'm good at the design and the architecture. And hopefully all of you can help bring your smarts and some of my design and your ideas and we'll make something that makes the Kubernetes people scared. Just kidding, uh, I'm not trying to hurt Kubernetes. So um, some background really quickly, you know, there's the engine, the resources in the language. It runs in parallel, it's event driven, it does distributed system stuff, all this usual stuff. We have like a whole bunch of resources now. Um, it's kind of crazy. These ones with the stars, if you can see over there, they, they are a little bit magical and we're going to talk about some of them today because they are a collection of resources that all work together. And for type reasons and other reasons, that's kind of super exciting. Um, this is, I got this quote, must be 20 plus years ago, early programming days. Um, this is really kind of 
one of my guiding principles. We want to have a language um, that, uh, in, in, put another way, MCL, the language that I've built, that, that, is, uh, that you're going to see today, it's optimizing for glue code. MCL is the glue code of your infrastructure, and I'm optimizing for that. That should be super easy, super safe. Um, for you to write stuff, to reconfigure your infrastructure. Um, a beautiful example that I forget someone had, had uh, mentioned to me and I realized this is the point, but they expressed it so clearly. Uh, for consultants, they have some base stack and you know, it's a bunch of Terraform or whatever it is and they kind of have that initial stack and they copy paste, rename some stuff for client one, two, three with constant tweaks, right? Who's done that? It sounds, sounds like it's pretty common, right? And so here's the thing, if we make that glue language so efficient, so powerful, so much power with few lines of code, um, you'll be easy to understand and you'll be able, it'll be easy to just edit you know, a few things for each customer and it won't be as much work to build you know, bespoke infrastructure tools for each separate customer. Is that a good idea? Are you all asleep because it's the end of the day? Yeah. All right, you wanna see uh, some, some stuff? Do you wanna see some live demos? I'm going to need a little bit more enthusiasm or you're not seeing a single demo. Thank you. Thank you. I worked my butt off for these demos. So yeah, we want to see a quick demo. What? Yeah, so just, just really quickly, uh, I don't need this folder. Um, I have over here, um, you know, I built MGMT before. It's all built. It's pretty easy. Um, the kind of uh, simple example that you've seen before, whoops, hello, zero.mcl, is if I run MGMT on the left, oops. Not like that. Um, oops. I'm just bad at typing. There we go. If you run MGMT on the left, you have a simple thing. You know, I've, I've shown this a hundred times, but um, uh, it creates a file, you've said statically. But MGMT is monitoring the state. So if you remove the file and cat the file, it comes right back. And as everyone's sort of seen, if you remove the file and cat the file, is that big enough for everyone to see? Yeah, yeah? good. Um, it's really, really fast, right? So watch dash n 0 0.1, um, and it just you know it's always just waking up on the on my left here, and uh, till you kill it, and then obviously, yep, no, it didn't die. I just killed it on the left. Felix is like, ah, I found a bug. No, sorry, you didn't. He's been waiting the whole day. Like I knew there was a bug. Um, the bugs are much more subtle, Felix. Come on. <laughs> Um, and so, um, so that's just, just to show you the code uh, to that, that's just really, just looks like a simple resource, right? It's a static resource, that's what it does. Um, the more interesting examples, which again I've shown before, um, I'll actually just show this on the, this side. I'm gonna, oops, oh my god, I can't type. Um, see if this one will work. I have a bug in this demo, but we'll see. Um, so, um, if I just open up this code, oops, honestly, I'm so bad at typing when there's people around. Um, so this code, if you can see it, is just, um, no syntax highlighting because I don't have a language server or any of that cool stuff, but I have these functions, so date time dot now, and it's not a single value the way it is in an imperative programming language. It's not about when you call it. When you call it, when you put it in the code, it's actually a stream of values. So I can't really point with my finger, but if you look here, when this value updates, um, this expression evaluates and then re-updates, uh, then that means this variable gets updated. And when this gets updated, the thing that consumes it. And so I have basically the current date, some math, the system load, again, a real thing from the Linux kernel, and a simple function I built called a view meter. And all of these are just taking a bunch of strings and gluing them in together into a file. Excuse me. Um, and if we, uh, there we go. So MGMT is, oh, I need to probably make this directory. It's not gonna work. There we go. In my code, it doesn't say to make the directory, but if you see, I have this file. And just to show you what's really happening, uh, I can't type again. I'm just going to cat this file so you can see in real time. You can see the file keeps changing because the streams of values update and it pushes into the file. And if I clap, you can see the view meter actually goes up because it's sampling my microphone in real time. Uh, it's just an input stream. 
And if you look at what's actually happening back on the slides, so this is what we actually do is we take that code and the compiler builds what we call a function graph, not a resource graph. Um, so just the simple code you see here, uh, printf, some string, and then a, this is just a function that returns the value 42. You have that function call here, it points to this graph, you have the string, the format string, points to this node, and the values propagate through this, this DAG, this directed acyclic graph. Uh, same thing for here. That's a super simple line of code. Uh, a very medium program might look like this. And I mean, very honestly, very, very small. Um, even slightly bigger programs look like this. And the real programs that we're building have these huge graphs. Um, and it, it kind of wastes a lot of memory if you think about it. But on the flip side, uh, one, memory is cheap. And two, we can now efficiently move data through these graphs. We never have to reevaluate things. Um, and I'm going to tell you some more cool stuff about that. Um, now, here's the, the, the thing that kind of sucks. Whenever we have a lambda, uh, if we didn't have lambdas, the shape of these graphs at compile time would be 100% static. But I want my life to be harder. So what actually happens when we spawn a lambda, we actually change the shape of the graph in real time, compute some stuff, and then close it back down. It's kind of cool. Um, you want to see that? Yes. For everyone else that didn't want to see that, do you want to see that? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. OK, so anyway, so we're going to kill this example. Don't worry, Felix. It didn't crash. Um, and uh, I love hecklers. I can, I can heckle back. And I've got the microphone and fireballs. Um, OK, so um, which example am I going to show you? I'm going to show you uh, this one. Um, so this is uh, lambdas. So I just have some system packages um, at the top that are built into MGMT. And then I have this uh, math.mat mod daytime.2. This just makes it so this Boolean here on the left, mod, flips from true to false to true to false every second. And then right here, we just have, we're storing a function right here. So it's fn is, is a, the type has a type function of what? What's the type of the function, anyone? Function signature? I told you, this is a hardcore talk. Come on. Function uh, it's, what's the type, though? Probably func function. Func of? Int to int anything. Is it int to int? So it's something to int. So, um, so the interesting thing, actually, so the function as it's defined um, here uh, does not have a precise type. It's just a func of something to something. Um, we know that len returns an integer. So it's a something, something to int. And then this uh, right here, we have these lists of strings. Those lists of strings, which are going to be this string or this string, so we're going to swap the two lists back and forth, go into in one which goes into this iter.map function. And that is when we precisely turn the func of some input type into a func that takes a list of inputs. Or, uh, excuse me, the map takes a list of uh, strings, and the func itself is going to take a string. Because that map function, uh, that lambda gets called on each element of the string. Okay, I explained that really badly, but it was my first time. Um, and then all of that we're just going to print out. Make sense? OK, so let's run that. Um, I don't remember what the name of the file where I stored this code is. It's all online. So you can definitely just work along with me and uh, land those. I just write down the file names because I don't remember. OK, map, iterator, simple. So I'm running MGMT, and the file is uh, right here. So there's actually no file. So I just did a print. And remember, so if we look at our code, uh, over here, we have these A, B, C, or A, B, B, C, C. So there's the, the length is 1, 2, 3, and then we have 6, 5, 4. Um, and if you see here, and we're switching the list, we're saying run the iterator on this list, a second goes by, run it on that list. And so you'll see it just hops back and forth. 1, 2, 3, 6, 5, 4. Duh, duh, duh. This is abstract. This is not a real world use case, um, just to show that it really works. Cool? Yes. What are you missing? Uh, you want to see the function graphs? Yes. You're like, well, what are you getting yourself into? Um, so that is stage graph is so. Uh, nope. Um, stage graph is. So remember how I told you that the graphs change shape? So um, I'm going to show it just, I'm not going to zoom in just right away because it's not that interesting. But so initially, you have nothing. Right? And then we start up, we compile the program, and we generate a single graph, which looks kind of stupid. 
This is, the, this is not a fake graph. This is the actual graph for the code you just saw. Cool? So you know exactly. And all these random constants, like these should actually be labeled and have better strings, but you know, we're being lazy. Um, so it's not as descriptive as it could be. Um, so we have that graph. Oops. I need to do start.jpg. It'll be a lot nicer. Nope. PNG, I think. Yeah. Debugging on the fly. So there's our first graph. And then you can see here, now graph is shuffles things around a little bit. So you really have to think about the structure. Um, and in fact, I really wanted to make it a real animation, but I didn't do it. So if you want to take a list of graphs and animate them for me, that'd be super cool. And you can see now it starts expanding out. I'm going to go through it first, then we'll look at it a little bit closer. It's expanding out. It's expanding out. It's getting big. Oh my goodness, it's getting so big. And then it's going to shrink back down into nothingness, <laughs> like our universe. Um, so for the physics people out there. So this is all happening in real time, right? Like when this is running, um, oops, wherever it's running, uh, that goes over there. Where'd my window go? I lost MGMT. No, it's not there. Um, it's taken over. It's a botnet. The AI and M MGMT have gone over. I guess I killed it. But um, yeah, so um, that's, that's constantly happening in real time because um, the reason is because we cannot determine at compile time the number of elements in the list. So what we actually have to do is we have to actually receive the list. We pause the graph. We very quickly spawn a whole bunch of mini graphs that are all connected to process each uh, element in that list. We do that, and if they're not needed, we shut it down. If it stays the same, we don't need to change the graph shape. And this is happening you know, thousands of times per second, I guess. I don't know. I'm just making up numbers. Is that cool? It's cool. Um, you want to see, I'll just show you really quickly here. Um, over in the middle, just somewhere in the middle at the kind of peak of the graph, um, you can actually see here, we have um, you know, these map elements. 0, 1, 2, and you can see this is the weird thing they spawn from. And then over here, uh, this 0 here is because it's the 0th argument to the len function. We run the length function three times. We get the output. Um, the func value comes in here, and this map zoop, is what spawned the whole thing. And so this whole kind of piece on the side gets spawned out and then collapsed back down. Cool? cool. Yeah, it's nerdy. Um, See this dotted line thing here, by the way? This is a visualization related to some weird data structure magic we do. And I was talking with my friend Sam, who implemented this dotted line, because we didn't have that. It was just floating before. And I was like, yeah, it would be really useful if we could do that, but that's like too impossibly hard. And he was like, oh. And literally 20 minutes later, he had a patch, which like, you know, not nice Golang. He's, not, he's a Haskell programmer. He's not a Golang guy. But man, just genius. Like something for me that is impossibly hard is a 20 minute thing for him. And, and, the, and here's why you should work with other people. It's super beautiful, uh, us working together, because stuff that he doesn't understand at all, like it's super simple to me. And when we're pair programming together, sometimes I'll be like, oh yeah, no, that's wrong. And he's like, how do you know it's wrong? Like you have no reason to believe that's wrong. And then 20 minutes later, we go through and he's like, Ah, you were right about that thing that's wrong. It's, it's uncanny. So find someone who is different from you to work with. You'll, you'll be able to build more interesting things that way. Okay. Um, uh, any quick one second questions or do you want to see something even cooler? Cooler. cooler. What about the rest of you? Cooler. All right. Uh, so yeah, big graphs. So, um, so what can MGMT build? So I have actually brought here a standalone computer. Uh-oh, the screws are falling out. Um, apparently not a very good one. Um, so it's just a, it's kind of like a fat Raspberry Pi, but it's an x86 machine. It has an Ethernet port, which is plugged directly into my laptop. Um, and it has a little HDMI port, which I am going to plug into my laptop. And the cool thing about that, uh, let me just want to set up here. Um, oh my God. Where is that code? There it is. Okay, so I'm going to start that up, and then over here, I'm going to show you. Right. Something like this. Yeah, that works. So that is just going to show the output of the screen. Okay, so it's not on, so at the moment it's just nonsense. Um, and what I'm going to do, um, just in case someone is brave, instead of doing this 
provisioning demo on this uh, computer that I have, I want to know, does anyone have a laptop they'd like to lend me? <laughs> I'm going to install a brand new OS on it, completely erasing all of your data live in 20 minutes uh, in front of you. Anybody? Do you want a brand new distro on your laptop? No? Uh, Fedora. Yeah. Uh, Arch? Anyone? No, I'm just kidding. OK, I mean, I could do this. It would be a little bit risky, because uh, maybe have some weird firmware bug that I haven't hit. But um, all right, so I was right to bring a laptop. So this is what I'm actually going to do. This is the code. So there's obviously, there's core resources and functions built into MGMT. Um, and those are usable in all sorts of scenarios. And what I did is I took a few of those, and I glued them together with MCL code. And the entire lines of code, not including this stuff here, is like max like 500 lines of code. So I've built a provisioning tool that all is one single binary. Um, and here's what I'm going to show you. So we have this modules provisioner. That's the, the, the code, the 500 lines. And so you come along, you import that. And uh, the provisioner package, the string here, basically magically the last uh, token in the path becomes a, a variable here. And so it has a few things that it provides, this package. One of them is base. And base just takes a struct with a few um, input fields, right? So this is basically ETH0 for my laptop's Ethernet port. Um, I just choose what network. There's defaults if you don't want to pick these numbers. But it makes sense, right? Yeah? Um, and there's a scratch directory and so on. So we import that. The second thing we do is we define a repo. So what distro? Fedora, uh, the architecture, um, which kind of flavor, which version. This is 38. Um, and where the actual um, packages come from. Now, I actually did an rsync before, because I don't want you to wait for that. But I have a new version of this demo that doesn't need to rsync. It'll just speculatively pull down the packages and cache them the first time they're used. But that's not uh, published yet. So at least for now, um, makes sense? And then lastly, um, you put something like this. You define all of the hosts that you want to provision. Um, you can have it just do anything. But it's nicer to have a, say, only do these MAC addresses so you don't accidentally plug in a machine and then erase it. So I just put the MAC address, what IP I want that machine to have. Uh, in this case, I have a root password. Uh, if anyone wants to uh, decrypt that, you can. The host name. And I have a flag provision true, right? You can also add a few packages. I actually added Kause, uh to the demo version. Uh, but I didn't um, test that. So let's hope Kause works. Um, and then lastly, this, when you do this include, again, you have a, a name here and a struct with all this config as hostname. Hostname gives you a handle to all of this code that's running. And then you can do something like dollar sign hostname one. It's the same hostname right there, dot provision. So there's magic variables or functions that get kind of exported from this uh, class inclusion that, um, that are live variables, right? So um, there's actually a small bug that I haven't fixed, but basically it should probably work. Uh, when this becomes true, um, it will just in real time print out that message. But instead of printing out a message, you could do something like uh, deploy cluster 2, deploy cluster 3, or you know, magic. Is that OK? Let's start this running before I talk too much. Um, right, so that's over here. Uh, I just have to plug in the machine, and then this should work. Let's see what happens. Um, and over here, I'm just going to, I made some files that change state in the directory. No, that's not the issue. That's a great question. Remind me about that. So I have some state data, some state variables that I just put out to text files just to see what's going on. And so it's trying to start up over Pixie right now. And now you can plug your Ethernet port into a switch and then have multiple computers. But I didn't want to bring a switch, and you can always just plug directly. Um, and let's see if this starts over Pixie Boot in a second. And uh, yeah, it's always nerve-wracking doing these kind of demos. This has worked lots of times, but you know, might have to debug something on the fly. Why is it not going? Let's see if I messed with my network. Mm, no, should be OK. Let's just see what happens. Mm. Yeah, I mean, th there's a MAC address that comes with this, any, any computer that has a MAC address. Um, and uh, why aren't you working? That's super embarrassing. Let's see what happens. 
if he's going to time out. Weird. Uh, oh, I know what's wrong. I know what's wrong. Um, what's wrong is I rebooted my computer, and the one part of MGMT which I didn't um, do yet is I didn't set up the firewall. So allow me to do that. I don't have a firewall resource yet. Um, modules. Uh, okay, yeah. So I have to actually open up my firewall manually because um, I didn't build a resource for MGMT yet. So I think that's the issue. Okay, yeah, that was the issue. Nice. And this is my kind of philosophy. If you know what you're doing, you should be able to live, uh, live work through that. Um, and one other little thing, so I actually run this command on the build so that the binary itself gets root access to a few things. So if ever asked that next question, um, the reason it was erroring is because since this device is offline, there's no power, so it thinks it's disconnected. So it errors setting the local uh, IP address on my machine. Um, and so that's what you are seeing. Um, here's an interesting thing. My type unification algorithm is super slow. Um, it only happens at compile time. Um, and it happens twice for a weird reason, which we'll get rid of. Um, but it kind of sucks, because you have to wait like 20 seconds for this to run um, the first time. And that's what we're sitting through right now. Um, yeah, so now it's going to provision. So I did this uh, talk in the Golang dev room. And I realized it's kind of a little bit boring watching machines provision. But I have to say, like for me, it's kind of, is the word cathartic? I'm not so good at English. Because as a sysadmin, I've spent like, like years of my life sitting and watching machines provision. I don't know if you've all done this. Like watching DNF do its thing, like DNF updates, sys updates, all this stuff. And it's kind of like, I don't know, it never felt bad to me. Um, so now you're suckered into this too. Like it or hate it. Um, yeah. Yeah. And so, um, so basically one of my next few projects is I have to actually write efficient type unification code because I'm doing all sorts of crazy hacks. It used to be much worse and then I made it. My goal is always to make it just good enough because if I do all the work by myself, then companies won't uh, pay. Um, so yeah, so basically I'm going to plug in this computer now. Should be starting up in a second. Okay. And so now, hopefully, everything should work. Okay. Yeah. So, so basically, um, MGMT's resources just set up a THCP server, a TFTP server, DHCP server. Um, and uh, yeah. And so here, you can see it happening. Look right here. You actually can see the real live uh, happenings. So right now, it automatically uh, pulled up the scrub screen in kickstart mode. Uh, if I push the keyboard, which I don't have, I could change it to manual and do some stuff. But it's automatically doing that. And the really cool thing, you can see all the different things. You can see the DHCP request coming in right here. Uh, you can see which exact files it's trying to look for. Because this is a programmatic uh, TFTP and DHCP server that's in pure Golang in my project. So it's very useful if you have some weird piece of hardware that uh, you don't know what files it's requesting. Um, in fact, I found this machine requests files that I've never seen in any documentation anywhere. So some firmware engineer was like, oh, let's ask for this file too. And it's OK, because if it 404s, it moves on uh, in the search path to the next one. So um, over here, so it did a bunch of EFI stuff here. Um, what was this file, VM Linux and initrd? What, what are those? Felix says kernel stuff, yeah. So you have to have those. It's basically initial kernel that's going to boot up to run this installer. And what it's going to do, it's um, going to download, if I caught it, right here. It's going to download this file right here. This file is a file that we template. We don't, create a we don't have to create a physical file. It's just in memory, although we can put it on disk, um, which is a template of the um, setup that we want to actually do. So which packages to install, how to partition the disk. And again, all of that is um, built into MGMT. If you look uh, here, actually, I don't have it here, but there's another field you can add to the struct part or partition or something. And you can choose which partitioning style you want, if you want BTRFS or X4 or XFS or whatever. And you can choose all these different settings to customize things. Um, and so it's starting up. I can actually zoom in here, I think. Nope. 
Yep. And go like this. MPV hacks. And I can do this. And this. Oops, wrong way. And so if you just want to see what's happening. So basically, Anaconda started. It took this kickstart file. It's checking the storage, doing something. Um, and if you want to get some more information about what's going on, in parallel, I can cheat. I have a hack. Do you want to see a hack? Yeah. yeah. Yes. So I just have a wget here, which I have carefully crafted because I know how the magic works. Can you all see that? Yeah. And so this is just the magic path, which is there. And if I run it, here, I'll just um, we'll go over here, just so you can see it actually works. Press enter, boom, you see the file get requested. This is the kickstart file, which is what the machine automatically downloaded. Um, and it just generated some stuff. Uh, the networking, this is a template in MCL, so very simple. Uh, the repositories, obviously it's going off of my local machine. You're pointing, something cool. Kause, yeah, uh-oh, oh no, I forgot to put the new line. So this is gonna break, uh-oh. Should I restart it quickly to show you? No, it's gonna break when it tries to install the packages. Maybe, I, I don't know. I knew I should have tested it before I added Kause. Does it skip? Jeez, let's see. Uh, oh well. Yeah, it won't cow say. Oh yeah, no, I definitely need to skip it. Um, geez. Yeah, yeah, I'll show the. Yeah, it's gonna. I know, I know. Someone have a keyboard? Someone have a USB keyboard? Cow say. Yeah, see, that's why you test your, I, I was just like, I'm gonna add Kause, it's gonna be fun. I didn't think about that. Uh, okay, so we're gonna kill this. You are required in this array to put your own new line. It's a templating bug, because I never tested oh. installing more than one package. Yeah, whoops. Um, so that's stupid. Um, Have you seen the template? Yeah, I'm gonna show you the template. We're gonna, oops, kill that. Um, I just got rid of Kause. That's super embarrassing. Oh well, anyways, so this is the, you know, this is what we do. We test, and uh, uh, while that's starting up, um, I'm going to just wait. Uh, while that starts up and then starts provisioning, I can tell you about a few other things. So I actually took some screenshots. Uh, this is just, you know, working on a random computer. It works on old crummy computers like this one, um, and downloads the packages, does its thing. Uh, someone asked a question about this error that they saw in the network. Um, so the, the cool thing is um, it's trying to set the IP address of the device, but you can't set an IP address if a device is down. And so what actually happens is it tries and it fails because it was like, hey, you asked me to set this IP address. It doesn't know if I unplugged the cable. Um, and then what actually happens is when this machine powers on, that device comes back online and MGMT notices the state has changed of the network. It says, oh, something has changed. Let's try again. And it does that. Um, and you can configure with metaparameters if it retries and, and not and so on. Um, it uses Netlink, yep, yep, in, exactly. So we wrap any kind of events we can depending on what we're, we're looking at. Um, and uh, yeah, pretty straightforward. Um, so, and while we're waiting, we can actually go here and just check that, oops, I'm glad I checked. Uh, oh yeah, the server's not up yet. We're gonna check that kickstart file. Um, if you want. If you're bored, you don't wanna stick around, you definitely can leave, but yeah. Uh, um, so basically what I'm doing, uh, and I'll talk a little bit forward in my talk, um, some really cool things about FRP languages that I wanted to tell you about. Um, you can actually instrument your programs in real time. Like you can take a variable, because it's an event stream, and you can just pull it out and look at it, and you can see how the variables are changing as your program is running. It's kind of cool. Uh, I, you, know, you can do that with fancy GDB hacks with other uh, compilers, but this is even easier. Uh, you could even graph their, their states over time and so on. Um, okay, this must be running. That looks okay. Okay, let's plug this back in. <clears throat> so you can see that. Um, there's this one. You can see... Oh. Um, you can see I have a TFTP client, uh, and if you want to see what actually gets pulled down, um, it's actually just, again, another template. 
<clears throat> of exactly what you expect. Okay, and so then here's our machine. Uh, it's downloading the stuff again, and I think this time it's gonna for sure work. <clears throat> we'll see. Um, yeah, so yeah, just a few things while that's provisioning. Um, so yeah, you can do that, it's very fun to debug. Um, so at the moment I have uh, an rsync, basically I exec the rsync to pull down the mirror and it knows how long to cache it for and when to recheck and so on. That's all automatic, but you have to pull down the whole mirror, which is like 100 gigs or something silly. Um, and that's a temporary hack. And what I realized I can do is I can actually have an HTTP uh, resource for um, just the file, but that gets it from the mirror. So what will actually happen is, um, yeah, you want to see some more code? Yes. Yeah, this is actually very cool. Uh, provisioning. So yeah, just this is the tree of the, the code. It's, oh, that's all the, the firmware stuff. That's just blobs. But there's literally, there's the files directory. And there's just those templates, very simple. Not too unlike Puppet, but also kind of different. We have the main.mcl. This is all of the code that's with lines and comments and like W, like work in progress stuff, 445 lines of code, like a whole provisioning tool. And again, the goal is not for me to sell you and convince you to use a provisioning tool. That might be one tool you want to build. But the other thing is you can take that, customize it, build entirely new tools that I have not thought about. You could build a very simple, uh, Nomad Container Orchestrator clone in MCL. Uh, and I'm really looking to find out what the next thing I should build is. I'm going to be putting this in the hands of people to try it out with real provisioning workloads. Um, like it doesn't support, say, anything but Fedora at the moment because, you know, I just did the if this, get the mirror from these locations. But, you know, maybe you're a Debian shop and you want to try this out with a, a Debian and so on. Um, and the really cool thing, if we look at the HTTP resources here, um, so we have basically in MCL, there's a bit of mess here because of comment and debugging and hacking. Um, we have the HTTP server. This is kind of like a file, you know, the file resource in Puppet or whatever. Same idea, right? Except we have one that's called server. And we also have other resources called file. Um, and let's look at another one. Another one here. Uh, that's just a string. Another one here. And what actually happens at uh, compile time, uh, sorry, at runtime, all of the relevant HTTP resources get grouped together and it actually builds basically a custom HTTP server in real time. Uh, and you can add and remove pieces, you can add files to it and from it. Um, and lastly, the really cool part is we also have an HTTP flag resource. And what this is, is instead of serving a file on this path, it actually, um, when you send it a request, an HTTP post, to this special URL, the HTTP server actually takes your incoming uh, request and turns it into data that MCL can see. And that's what happens at the very end of provisioning. We run a post, like in the kickstart, which is a wget that pings this flag, and the flag says, oh, something has happened, and it changes the machine from not provisioned to provisioned, and it re-executes and does all this magic. Is that very complicated? It's a little complicated to explain, but once you have your hands on and you're playing with it, um, it's actually very easy to understand. Uh, at least I find it's very easy to understand. So now, we're back to where we were before. If you can see, it's actually downloading, look at all the stuff going by. It's downloading all the packages that it needs to install the, the Fedora machine. Um, I noticed it requests all sorts of weird, sketchy files. Like, uh, if I was like, uh, hypothetically, a three-letter US agency, that wanted to have like special things happen when magic files were in certain locations, like this would be a great place to hide it. Who's checked what it's actually downloading? Has anyone ever looked what it actually requests? Anyone? I was surprised, one person. Um, I don't, I'm not actually implying anything uh, malicious, but like it just surprises me so much. I've been kickstarting for, I don't know how many years, 10, 15 more years, and I never knew that it asked for some weird little things. So it was kind of an interesting learning experience as well. So it's installing all the packages, which you can see. Uh, is that big enough? You get the idea. Um, you can see all the packages going by. And then we'll flip back here. Um, so yeah, so back to that code that I was just talking about um, in wherever it went. I've lost it. Um, we can have also a new resource that I plan on writing, an HTTP cache resource, which will have uh, the base prefix of the actual mirror. 
So it'll actually offer that file into this dynamic HTTP server. And so the very first time that it requests the file, it basically requests, the machine requests the file from my laptop. The laptop will transparently block request it from the internet, it'll pull it down, relay it on, and then the second time um, you run this, uh, it'll just already be there. And so if you provision machines, you'll have the exact offline copy of every file you need and nothing more. Um, and some time back, I remember actually trying to get from the Anaconda developers, hey, is there a way I can just find out exactly the minimum set of files that this Anaconda is going to generate? And they're like, yeah, we don't know. It does its thing. But so this is literally a way to instrument your provisioning, capture what you need, and then put that in a minimally uh, kind of perfect offline uh, way for future builds. Um, I care about everything working offline because you should have complete control of everything. And this is the step one in greenfielding a data center that's down. Like if your routers are down, if everything is down, you have no internet, like what do you do, right? Um, this is like if Google goes down, if Amazon goes down, uh, if, if enough important pieces go offline, they're out of business. They do not have a solution, as far as I know, and I have no insider knowledge here, but they have no solution to actually greenfield or uh, bootstrap a data center or their own infrastructure. Because their own infrastructure depends on their own infrastructure. Right? Like, this is completely crazy. Does anyone have, do you know companies that, that are careful about this? Are they really like 100% good? I don't believe that. I mean, I sat and watched them turn a data center Did they? Scratch. What if everything goes offline? Then they're fucked. Yeah. So like, yeah, so that's the thing. It's a hard problem. But um, I really am coming, and I've taken a long time to build MJMT because I'm going all the way back to first principles, thinking what do I absolutely need to build things the right way? Um, anyone who set up Cobbler, I set up Cobbler a long time ago, or Red Hat Satellite, or I don't know, whatever provisioning tools, how long did it take you to set up that tool? Ages. Ages? If you copy this single binary to your laptop and run it, and then wait 30 seconds for type unification, you have a provisioning tool. Is that better? We're gonna need you to fix that. What? We're gonna need you to fix it. I need an algorithmist. I'm not a good algorithmist. Um, so yeah, that's what's going on there. Um, this is what I think is, this is config management to me. This is, um, and people say, oh, it's too dynamic, whatever. What's actually happened is we want real-time dynamic things, but we've farmed them off to other tools. We've farmed them into Kubernetes. We've farmed them into all these other sketchy products that you have to glue together. Um, we are just that dynamic piece. But we call it, I call it config management because that's what I truly believe it, it should be. But, you know, it's naming. It's, uh, some people say it's a choreography tool. Um, I'm just going to finish some slides and then we'll watch the provisioning finish. Does that make sense? Uh, future work. Type unification performance I told you about. Um, remember this whole graphs changing in real time? Uh, I have some concurrency bugs. Um, like if a bunch of things error at the same time, it can in some per small percentage of the time deadlock, uh, which is fine because it's dying, but it's not good in general. I have some bugs there and there's some other small things. So if you're good at going concurrency, uh, definitely would love your help. Uh, my error messages, if you have like a missing comma or like basically early Lex or parser stuff are really bad. Uh, and I won't lie, I have briefly kind of manually bisected my own code, like delete half of it, is the error still there, yes, no, to kind of find out where the typo is. Because uh, I don't have good error messages yet. It's fine, but it's not something you want long term. And actually the good thing is I only expect a very small number of people to actually need to write MCL. Only the creme de la creme, you people, will write the MCL. Everyone else will just consume a module. Like, um, I had this pu problem with Puppet. How many HTTP modules are there for Puppet? Like 50, 20? There's definitely at least 20. Everyone wrote their own because code was not reusable. I have worked so hard on the module system, someone will be able to write an MCL module and that's going to be good for 99% of everyone. And if you're that 1%, it's probably because you're working at some weird fang company that has some ugly Cloudflare hack. I mean, some ugly hack that you're doing something weird and special. So I think that's going to make the whole, like, you don't have to understand MCL as, as well as, you know, you would have needed to understand Puppet. Make sense? Um, we want to build a whole bunch of stock tools just to prove out MGMT. So maybe a container scheduler could be one. 
uh, a, a tool that sets up a distributed sets up and continuously manages. That's key. Day two, um, a distributed Ceph file system. That's uh, one of my short list. Um, if you have any ideas of what um, you know we should build, uh, I need suggestions. And actually, I had this realization like maybe a few weeks ago. Um, so we have these. We have MCL, which is constantly generating. MCL is a, a function graph which generates a stream of resource graphs. And those resource graphs um, swap from A to B to C to D very, very quickly. And I actually came up with a crazy way in my head uh, to actually do it even more quickly. Um, but like, it's kind of a little bit tricky, but algorithmically it would work. So they're already pretty fast, but I think they could be like, like mill millisecond, like a few, like very, very, very fast. So if you want like a crazy hard graph problem, uh, come see me. Um, same thing, I'm provisioning on x86-64. If anyone knows anybody that works at uh, uh, ARM64 kind of chip company that wants to, I know I'm thinking of Dave, I'm just, uh, I'm just teasing him. If anyone wants to send me a demo board so I can try this on other architectures, uh, other things, uh, please. I have Raspberry Pi, so I'm doing that probably next. Uh, but you know, if you have some cool stuff, this is, you know, needs, needs uh, help. Uh, this is still installing. It's just finishing the configuring step. Um, I don't really know about business or money or all this stuff. I'm just some weird nerd. Uh, but I got to make this serious, right? Either I go back and work for Amazon or some big company like to make some money or I keep working on this. And so I really need a way to make some money because I don't want to have to make a proprietary thing. And do you want a proprietary thing? No. So I need you to be really serious, real talk here. Um, I have a little sign up form for this new MGMT partner program I'm starting. Find your companies, convince them to sign up. Um, I have tiers uh, as low as 100 euros uh, per year for individuals, 1,000 to 5,000 euros per year for uh, small companies, medium companies, things like that. And what I want you to do is such a small amount of money, people are saying, no, you got to ask for a lot of money. I don't want to ask for a lot of money. I want it to be so easy that if you have a budget struggle with this, it means you're not really serious about investing in this technology. And I want you to invest that small amount of money in me, in uh, this small team that I'm trying to assemble. And every month or two, I'm going to send you a little newsletter, let you know what's going on, and I'm going to send you some prototypes, uh, the provisioning tool, some other stuff. I'm going to listen to what you're interested in, and I'm going to try and just have kind of the bare cash just to pay for food. I'm definitely still losing money. Uh, trust me, I can make much more at a big company, but that's not my goal. But this won't work if you don't really commit to signing up. So I have a QR code. Oops. Take a photo uh, if you want. And then, uh, then we're going to go back to provisioning. So hurry up, take your photos. Uh, just a little Google form. It's not great. Um, but please push this, sign up. Uh, this is kind of the make or break. Um, I want to provide real value, but I need to get real funds out of it. Does that sound reasonable? If we do not fund open source software, we are not going to have open source software. Like we're losing this. And, and this is why. This is why. This is the moment, uh, at least for me. So um, I'll show that again at the end. Um, yeah. OK. So this is just about done. It's just in, oh, that didn't work. Ah, did I break? I have another bug actually, but uh, oh. it's running the post script, but I think I have another template bug because I added some other hacks. So let's see if this actually works. Um, yeah, I was just having too much fun hacking last night. And uh, um, so it runs, I added a sleep here for some fun because I was debugging some stuff, but you can see it's actually all grouped together. Um, but even if it doesn't run it, I can actually cheat. So what it actually does is it runs this command with done equals true. I'll give it a sec. Yeah. So it runs this command. Uh, I just faked it because I still have that templating bug. Whoops. Um, test your code, folks. Um, and so it actually re-runs MGMT. Uh, it does some math and figuring out. And it flips those variables from will provision uh, to will not provision and is provisioned. And you can see that when this machine uh, starts up in a second, it uh, will skip the, um, 
you know, you don't want it to reprovision itself forever and ever. Make sense? Uh, so the only kind of shitty thing, I always have stupid hardware issues. The timeout, the Pixie timeout is so long. So it's like, come on, like, why don't we have open core or whatever, like fix the firmware problem. This part of the stack needs uh, much smarter people than me. And so, but MGMT is not going to provision it. And then the UI, like in the package tool is you just have a, a flag you can set. Do you want to reprovision the machine? Yes, no, and so on. Pretty straightforward. So that'll boot up in a second. Um, and then we can SSH into it. And yeah, this is just Pixie timeout. Um, if you're a large company and have clout with the hardware vendors, like, uh, yeah, all these little things need fixing. But yeah, that you know, just makes your machine take another uh, 15 seconds to start up. Any quick questions while we're waiting for that? Can Don't be shy. Can we see the template for the Kickstarter? Yeah. Uh, go ahead, Dave. I was not. Okay, because his contention was that everything kind of, you, you have a, you sort of worked your way around an abstraction block and uh, mm -hmm. anything that's simple is very simple because there's not less. Yeah. And it gets more complicated. Yes, I, I saw that end bit. So I have actually strong opinions about simplicity and all these things. So do you, do you agree with his thesis or does it, um, it seems like you're no, I, so I don't think this is more complicated. I think that this, we, we want to do fancy things, right? We want to have servers that auto scale so that we don't waste power. Um, there's a lot of real use cases that we need to solve. And this is the simplest way that is possible to solve them, in my opinion. Uh, just to show you, and also you can SSH in because we still have that DHCP server running. So we can run in, the password is password. And there, this is, I don't have a keyboard, this is literally, that brand new machine, you can see um, it shows you the kickstart um, that got here, um, the original one. So kickstart takes the original one and then redoes it and you can say, whoops, I just forgot new lines. When I was joining, I just didn't put new lines. So kind of a simple templating bug. Um, and now we can mess up this machine. What should we do with the machine? Run some sketchy commands. Hmm? Anyone? <laughs> Is truth real? <laughs> Oops, um, what is it? Uh, been true. Yeah, thank you. Uh, still working. How about false? Uh, where the hell is libc? Don't do this. Oh, oops. <laughs> still working. Oh, bash, bash not working. Does anyone have a provisioning tool I can use? <laughs> Um, but yeah, and I, I didn't even bring a keyboard. Um, so yeah, that, so does it work? Um, there's still a little polish and small things to do, but if you sign up for this program, I'm going to send you a, a new version. If you find any bug, I'm going to fix it uh, and try and take this seriously. Um, how much time do I have left if at all? Uh, I think I'm a little bit over actually. So let's just recap. I love this Arthur Benjamin recapping joke, so I'm just stealing it. Um, <laughs> So we're still on IRC, although it's kind of quiet. Uh, maybe it's not as cool. So I have a MGMT config channel on Matrix. I don't really know how this works. Uh, Joe does, and he's an admin. He's responsible. Um, and uh, Red Hat was hosting our mailing list, but then Red Hat decided to make all mailing lists kind of internal only for admins. So our longtime mailing list that you know, lots of projects were using uh, is dead. So if someone has a mailing list that's stable long term that wants to let us host, uh, preferably for free. That would be ideal. Uh, if anyone knows anyone at um, Free Desktop, I opened a ticket, said, hey, can I have a mailing list? And they still haven't responded. So if you have some clout there, please let me know. Um, you know how to find me, purpleidea.com. Uh, you know, not a big deal. Uh, Purple ID on IRC Mastron. I have Twitter. Um, if you added me on Twitter recently, I'm not doing new stuff. I'm just kind of posting when I have a new blog post, but I'm not really interacting as much there. So if you want to get a back and forth, like ping me on, on Macedon or something like that. Um, on Wednesday, so not tomorrow, the day after, I will be here all day doing an MGMT workshop. So you can hands on, uh, try MGMT, play with stuff, um, get your laptop provisioned, anything you want. Um, and uh, silly things. Uh, I have some stickers here as well. So if you'd like a sticker and you plan to actually use it, please come up at the end uh, and get a sticker. Um, and I'm kind of like trying to figure out what to do. So I am officially looking for a job. 
particularly, uh, I'm not sure if what role is best, kind of flexible in terms of a team lead or a, a junior manager. I've been doing this mentoring program for a long time and it's been very successful. Uh, DevRel stuff, individual contributor stuff, kind of looking all over. Um, ideally, or well, remote, uh, ideally Golang, um, and ideally kind of MGMT. So I'm kind of seeing what works out. So if someone wants to hire me to do a bunch of MGMT stuff for your company, uh, even if it's not 100%, um, I've got to figure this out kind of soon. I have some runway. Uh, if I can do the partner program, if that works, and I get success. Uh, if not, I'll have to refund your money. And, uh, you know, I, have, I don't know. I'm just a, a nerd working on stuff that I believe in. Because uh, I really want us to have good infrastructure. We, we cannot allow uh, a small number of companies to control the world's computing infrastructure. We have to make this, uh, we have to make this accessible to everyone. And then we're gonna start with provisioning, automate things, and move on. So uh, that's my talk, thank you so much.